Hello friends, it is me, JJ, everybody's favorite. So last week we had a lot of fun talking about various works of pop culture that are in some ways distinctly American. And today we will continue that conversation using the many good examples that you guys left in the comments. I really have one of the smartest audiences on YouTube, I must say. It's true, whenever I talk to other YouTube people, they're always like, man, JJ, I wish my audience was as smart as yours. Your audience actually does what you ask them to do, whereas mine just spams me with endless comments comments about what a simp I am. Anyway, declaring a work of pop culture distinctly American is obviously subjective to some degree. Many different things will say American to different people. But the definition I was using last time, and the definition that I am going to continue to use today, relies on the following two variables. A, the work takes place in America, and the fact that it takes place in America, as opposed to somewhere else, is very central to its premise, and slash or B, the audience of the work has to have substantial pre-existing knowledge of American daily life, or history, or civics, or things like that, in order for the work to have maximum impact. If the audience doesn't have considerable knowledge of American culture, by contrast, the work will probably seem fairly alienating, or exotic. Okay, so that being the criteria, one of the most common nominees that you guys offered up was the 1994 Tom Hanks film, Forrest Gump. For those who haven't seen it, it is a movie about a sort of simple-minded guy who lives through some of the most fascinating decades of 20th century America, from his humble childhood in the rural south in the 1940s to his success as a businessman in the 1980s. What makes the film so good and so powerful is the contrast between the simple decency of Forrest Gump as a man and the wild, chaotic energy of 20th century America as personified by some of the other characters, particularly his love interest, Jenny. It is also a film with a lot of ironic humor, and one of the running gags is the way that Forrest Gump has sort of unintentionally been responsible for a bunch of big, important American things, from the Watergate scandal to the Happy Face logo. So yes, excellent choice. Forrest Gump was directed by Robert Zemeckis, a man who has produced a number of other very good and very distinctly American films as well, including Contact, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and the Back to the Future trilogy, which a number of you brought up as an example of very distinctly American filmmaking as well. Another name that came up a lot was Quentin Tarantino, undoubtedly another one of the great aggressively American filmmakers of the modern age. His 1994 crime film Pulp Fiction in particular is often held up as one of the masterpieces of modern American cinema. Pulp Fiction is a fairly complex film involving a lot of characters, but what makes it important from our perspective is just the degree that Quentin Tarantino went out of his way to cram the movie full of as many references to American life and culture as possible. So there are key plot points involving American history, sports, music, even fast food. You mind if I have some of your tasty beverage to wash this down? Even the title, Pulp Fiction, is itself a claim of continuity with the American tradition of pulp fiction storytelling, which is to say kind of tacky or trashy stories with over-the-top sex and violence, which of course is basically Quentin Tarantino's entire oeuvre. As far as TV goes, the shows made by Greg Daniels came up a lot. Greg Daniels was a writer for The Simpsons, a show I celebrated in the first video, who went on to co-create King of the Hill, the American version of The Office, and Parks and Rec. When you look at that resume, it is pretty clear that the man has a gift for creating distinctly American characters and settings. I must confess that I haven't seen that much of The Office, but I have seen every single episode of Parks and Rec, and that is a show that is just crammed to the brim with Americanness. Parks and Rec is a sitcom about the government of a fictional city called Pawnee, and it is quite Simpsons-like to the extent that Pawnee is used as a stand-in for like the entire United States. So most of the characters and settings represent very recognizable archetypes of American suburban life. And of course, the fact that the main setting is a government allows for all sorts of satirical comedy on American political controversies as well. Very funny show, very well written, very 
American. Greg Daniels is also a former writer for Saturday Night Live, a show that many of you nominated as well. Now, a lot of countries have shows that are kind of like SNL, which is to say a satirical show featuring comedy sketches about the news and celebrities and politics and society more broadly. So SNL is not necessarily a distinctly American idea, but it is the best American manifestation of a certain comedy tradition, which is to say very current events driven satirical comedy intended entirely for a domestic audience. Some of your other popular nominees for most culturally American TV shows included Twin Peaks, both the original and the reboot, The Sopranos, and Seinfeld. I don't have time to get into all of these shows right now, but they undeniably all take place in very vividly realized depictions of the United States. And they all tend to presume a lot of pre-existing American cultural knowledge on the part of their audience. When it came to the most American video games, these were the two most popular nominees by far, Fallout and GTA. Fallout is a series, now over 20 years old, that takes place in an alternative timeline in which all of American social and technological progress sort of plateaued in the 1950s, which led to a sclerotic and decadent society that eventually triggered a nuclear war, wiping out much of human civilization. A lot of the American cultural references that are found in the series thus take the form of the scraps of this sort of warped American society that have survived the post-apocalyptic world, as well as the general social commentary surrounding the entire nuclear war theme. Now, I must confess, I have never actually played any of the Fallout games. Some of you told me last week that Fallout 2 was probably the best one as far as being a object of American culture goes, just because it apparently contained a lot more explicit American cultural references and in-jokes than the sequels, which apparently got more bogged down in kind of generic sci-fi world building. I was hoping I could give Fallout 2 a try on Steam, but no luck for us Mac users. So feel free to just argue in the comments about which Fallout game is the most identifiably American. Now I have, however, played several of the GTA games over the years. A number of you singled out GTA 5 as the pinnacle of the series for our purposes, which makes sense since unlike Fallout, the GTA games have gotten more American, not less, with every passing sequel. So GTA 5 is an elaborate open world game that takes place in a fictional city that is supposed to be a satire on LA, but much like Springfield or Pawnee, is really more of a kind of broad satire of the entire United States itself. In fact, what is most interesting about the GTA universe is how absolutely everything is fictionalized. All of the places, brands, celebrities, even government agencies, and not politely fictionalized either. As TV Tropes puts it, every website, show, movie, poster, commercial, not plot important line, and comment on the radio is an unfriendly dig or parody of something. Emphasis on unfriendly. I would say GTA is a pretty mean-spirited caricature of America overall. An inflated depiction of basically every negative stereotype of American society, from an extreme gap between the rich and the poor, to a grotesque and vapid entertainment culture. But in any case, you really have to have a lot of pre-existing knowledge of America to get anything out of this satire. Since everything is supposed to be something, but nothing is ever explicitly spelled out for you. Now, GTA was made by Rockstar North, which is a British company, although lots and lots of Americans did work on it too. But in any case, I don't think something necessarily has to be made by 100% Americans in order for it to be a good work of American culture, although it does usually help. An example of a far more culturally ignorant American game made by foreigners would be Earthbound, which a number of you guys mentioned in the comments. Earthbound is a Super Nintendo role-playing game released by Nintendo of Japan in 1994 and created by famed Japanese humorist Shigisato Itoi. And don't get me wrong, I think it is a wonderful game, but it has this reputation as being some sort of clever commentary on American culture that I just think is completely undeserved. Earthbound does take place in a sort of vaguely American setting in the sense that it has high rises and shopping malls and hamburger restaurants. But beyond that, it is only American in the most superficial and stylized way, lacking much cleverness or insight or 
in jokes. In fact, I would say the game is filled with missed opportunities to make references to American regional cultures, or folklore, or pop culture. So in other words, if almost everything in GTA is a parody, almost nothing in Earthbound is. Now, when they brought Earthbound to the US, Nintendo of America tried to aggressively market it as a piece of Americana, portraying it as like a take on cheesy alien invasion movies and like tabloid culture and stuff. But when you actually play the game, it's pretty obvious that there's not much evidence that the game was ever intended to be this. So as a work of American cultural satire, I declare it overrated. Another sort of supposedly super American thing that I do not personally care much for, but a number of you brought up, is stuff like the movie Team America World Police or the game Bro Force. These are obviously things that present themselves as being super American, but the whole premise is that they are satirizing Americanness in the dumbest, most one-dimensional way possible. So they depict Americanness as being synonymous with a kind of crude, violent stupidity as seen in like 80s era action movies. I mean, I guess you could say that maybe this is some sort of commentary on American attitudes towards violence or US foreign policy or something, but in my mind, it is really just a kind of one joke caricature of a caricature without much depth. It is about as much of a window into American culture as say, Austin Powers is a window into British culture. All right, so now here is another thing that a number of you recommended, which I had never previously seen, but I sure am glad that I did. Over the Garden Wall. This is a short 10 episode animated cartoon series made by a young American animator named Patrick McHale. And it is a very, very funny and charming take on American fairy tales. I don't want to spoil too much about it because I really enjoyed coming in cold, but it is a show that has a lot of fun playing with various cliches and stereotypes associated with a certain kind of American folk story in the tradition of like The Wizard of Oz or Sleepy Hollow. It is a very smartly written show with a very strong satirical edge that is nevertheless not quite as blunt as some of the other things we've been discussing. Like there was this one episode where the two main characters go to visit a school, and I was laughing so hard at this episode because it is such a perfect parody of a certain type of American children's story without being an explicit satire of any one story in particular. Over the Garden Wall really reminded me of two other things both of which I think are great examples of distinctly American pop culture in their own right. The Nightmare Before Christmas, which is in many ways, I think a similar sort of love letter to some of the tropes of American folklore. And Cuphead, which is of course a pretty explicit salute to some of the cultural tropes seen in early 20th century American animation. If you like these, you will probably like Over the Garden Wall. All right, now let us talk about a couple of songs you guys nominated. A cool one that I never heard before was the song Alice is Restaurant by Arlo Guthrie, the son of the famous American folk singer Woody Guthrie. Interesting names in that family. Anyway, Alice's Restaurant is a very long song from 1967, almost 20 minutes long, that is really more of a just sort of long rambling story of a certain episode in Arlo Guthrie's life, what is sometimes known in American culture as a shaggy dog story. But it's a very uniquely American story that starts off being about Thanksgiving before winding into all of these weird and equally American places. When I was listening to it, I was reminded of the kind of long rambling ballad you'd like imagine an Irish folk singer to have written about taking the pig to the market or something. Alice's Restaurant is basically that kind of song, but with more contemporary American cultural references. A very unique work that is hard to summarize, but I recommend it. A lot of people also recommended American Pie, a 1971 song by Don McLean. This is another rather long song from the glory days of American folk rock. What is it about? Well, the lyrics are famously all over the place. Here is how the Washington Post put it. The song includes references to Karl Marx, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, or more likely John Lennon, the Fab Four, the Birds, James Dean, Charles Manson, the Rolling Stones, the widowed bride Jackie Kennedy, and the Vietnam War. Plus many other things that defined American culture at that time, including most notably the plane crash that killed Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the Big Bopper. People have tried to suss some deeper social commentary out of this dense stew of cultural references, 
But Don McLean himself has always maintained that the song was more about capturing the mood of a time than anything else. An indescribable photograph of America that I tried to capture in words and music. And who is best at capturing present day America in words and music? Uh, I'm not really sure that that sort of thing really exists as much these days. A couple people said early college dropout era Kanye, which I guess I can sort of see. A lot of other people said country music in general. Country music might be a very distinctly American style of music, but I think that ultimately it might be a little too regional to engage with more broadly resonant American themes and references. I kind of feel the same way about Western themed things in general, which a number of you brought up in different contexts. Though that's not to say that Bo Burnham's hilarious takedown of the country and Western music industry in the song Pandering which a number of you mentioned isn't a wonderful piece of work for what it is. A dirt road, a cold beer, a blue jeans, a red pickup, a rural noun, simple adjective. So, I hope you enjoyed this little tour of Americana. Thank you so much for all of your wonderful suggestions. My purpose in making these videos was to just call attention to the fact that American culture can in fact be a very distinctive and particular thing in contrast to the sort of bland, generic consumer culture of popular stereotype. It is a rich and distinctive culture that I, for one, am proud to be a part of, even though I am a Canadian. America and Canada are part of the same culture. It's fine. It's... Fine.